Oh, look, he's back again. Your friendly neighborhood ugaritologist, Ola Vikander, with more stuff that's both banal and awesome. Hopefully not all of it banal, hopefully all of it awesome about comparative linguistics, biblical studies and other stuff like that. When you're working with ancient languages, which is what I do in my civilian career, so to speak, when I'm not on YouTube, you tend to get one question a lot. And it's a good question. It's a question that recurs. I got the, this question just the other week in an, in an interview and here on YouTube, and I always get this question when I'm doing public lectures and stuff, and it always comes back. And again, that's because this is a really good question. And the question is, when you're working with ancient languages, how do you know how to pronounce them? And subjectively, this can seem like a very difficult question. You know, these are often languages that may have been dead in the sense of not having been spoken for hundreds or even thousands of years. Ugaritic, my specialty, was spoken in the late Bronze Age in the 1300s and 1200s BCE. And it's uh, been a dead language for, well, more than 3,000 years now. So how does one know how to pronounce it? And the same goes for, well, most pre-modern languages. How does one reconstruct their pronunciation? Yeah, this is a good question. And as all good questions, well, as many of them, it also has a good answer. But an answer that is a bit complicated because there's not one single answer to this question. It varies. It varies depending on what language we're talking about, and it varies depending on what kind of scholar you are. There are scholars of ancient languages that don't really care that much about how it sounded, that just adopt a modern reading pronunciation so as to make the texts possible to sound out in a modern, say, classroom setting, and then don't care much about how it sounded. One extreme example of this is ancient Egyptian, where the most common thing among Egyptologists today is to adopt a totally artificial pronunciation, which everybody knows never occurred in ancient times, where you just put an e sound between the consonants because hieroglyphics had signs for whole words and signs for concepts and, and signs for combinations of sounds, etc. Some of the signs were for single consonants and none of them were for vowels. So we know the consonants, but the vowels are normally not written down. And that means that many people who learn ancient Egyptian today just adopt an artificial e e e pronunciation. That's where you get all these e's in nefer for example, which is the Egyptian word for good and occurs in lots of names. You have so many Egyptian names that seem to have nefer in them when it was probably originally nafar and then nafa and then nofa and then nufa. But people today often read it as nefer for expediency. On the other hand, there are scholars today who have done enormous amounts of work and are doing enormous amounts of work with reconstructing what Egyptian actually would have sounded like at different points of its history. And that's another thing that has to be remembered. Egyptian, for example, is a language that is attested for an enormously long time, thousands of years, which means that the pronunciation changed a lot over that time. So you have to decide not only if you want to reconstruct an authentic pronunciation or, or as authentic as possible, but also what point in time you're aiming for, because these things did change. But that being said, how does one approach reconstructing the historical pronunciation of a dead language? Well, there are a number of sources you can work with and have to work with. The first one is that some ancient languages have living reading traditions to this day. That is, even though they're not spoken, they've been kept alive in reading traditions, often religious reading traditions. There we have examples like Sanskrit. Well, there are people who speak Sanskrit, but it hasn't survived through a spoken tradition. It's been a learned language. And we have the same thing with biblical Hebrew, where we have the synagogue reading pronunciations, which can differ quite a lot depending on where you are in the world. If you're using Sephardic Hebrew, Ashkenazi Hebrew, Mizrahi Hebrew, Yemenite Hebrew, and then you have modern Israeli Hebrew, which has become a reading tradition, so to speak, uh, unto its own if you use modern Hebrew pronunciation to read classical texts, which many but not everybody does or do. You have the same situation for Latin, for example, where you have ecclesiastical Latin and you have reconstructed Latin. And you have, uh, say, Old Church Slavonic, which has had a living reading tradition. And of course, classical Arabic and many others that have had this sort of ongoing recitational tradition that has been carried on through the ages. Thing is, 
that gives you something to start with, but you can't take any of these traditions at face value because even fossilized reading traditions change over time and they separate into different sub-traditions that can differ more and more, almost as in the divergence of dialects of a spoken language. Not in exactly the same way, but there are similarities to it. And you can see that, for example, in the case of Hebrew, where you have, a, like I mentioned, a number of quite different traditions of how to read classical Hebrew. There's been some very interesting recent work by Ben Cantor in Cambridge, who's been working on analysing these different reading traditions as almost as though they were dialects and trying to see how they developed and interacted with each other. So that's one thing you can use reading traditions of the ancient language, if there is such a reading tradition. There are such traditions for Hebrew, for example, classical Arabic, and many others. For Ugaritic, there isn't one, because Ugaritic died out totally. It didn't even survive as a read language. The same goes for Akkadian and Sumerian and many others. And then you can use, in some cases, uh, there are actually ancient descriptions from the speakers of the languages of the sounds they were using. Prime example of this is Sanskrit, where you have rather detailed phonological descriptions of the language from the time when it was used in spoken form. Then, of course, you have to decode what the technical terminology used in those sources actually means, because sometimes there's not an exact overlap between the terminology used in these pre-modern sources and the terminology, of course, used in modern phonetics and phonology. Another example of this is Arabic, for which we have the descriptions of the Arabic grammarians like well, the most famous of them is Sibawai, who wasn't actually an Arab by ethnicity. He was Persian, but he wrote the most famous grammar of classical Arabic and defined the sounds in there. But then you have to sort of translate his terminology into modern categories, which is sometimes a subject that's up for vociferous debate. But some languages have these sorts of descriptions of what the sounds would have sounded like at a certain point in time, which isn't... Again, not an infallible source because terminology changes, categories change, and so on. And sometimes, of course, people just get it wrong. But that's a very good type of source to use. And then you have transliterations of words in one language, your target language, so to speak, transliterations of words from that language into other contemporary languages that maybe you know a little more about in terms of how it sounded. So how does a certain language render sounds from another, and that can be from, you know, rendering of names or loan words or stuff like that. For example, one thing that interests me a lot is the fact that the sound in Ugaritic, which is written with a letter that is mostly reconstructed on etymological grounds as having been a th, that is like a th in English, a th, that sound is used in Ugaritic quite often to render foreign sounds that were actually s's, which has led Certain scholars, I'm one of them, to believe that the th of Ugaritic was actually not a th, but an s sound of some sort, that it had developed into an s sound. Not everybody agrees with this. There are scholars who disagree with it, but that's my position, at that at least in later Ugaritic texts, the th had changed into an s, and that is why that letter, the th letter, is used to render s sounds of certain foreign languages, like Hurrian, which we've talked about on this channel, and a couple of other languages as well. So that sort of interrelated data from transliterations is super important for reconstructing other pronunciations. Another example of this, which also has to do with S sounds, sibilance, which is a, a morass in <laughs> Northwest Semitic, is the fact that the letter and sound, the phoneme, that is known as samech in Hebrew, which in Hebrew is just an S. When you see that sound, which occurs in various Northwest Semitic languages, when you see that transliterated into Egyptian, it's written mostly in Egyptian with the letter that was pronounced something like ch, which is one of several things that suggest that the samech originally was not s, but ts, because it's much easier to imagine that Ts was rendered ch in Egyptian than that, that S was, because there was uh, actually two different S letters in Egyptian, but they normally don't use those to render the Samech. They use the ch letter. So there you can surmise that in the Bronze Age, at least in the late Bronze Age, most dialects of Northwest Semitic, perhaps not all of them, but many dialects of Northwest Semitic pronounced what would become the letter Samech in Hebrew, not as s, but as ts.
and you can see this from uh, other sources as well, the etymological relative of that letter in Akkadian, for example, when you have a T sound followed by a sibilant or sibilant-like letter, those often combine to what looks like SS. So Bitsu becomes Bissu, which makes much more sense if the S was originally Ts. That issue is fraught with many other complications because of the difficulties inherent in what the sh sound of Akkadian actually was. It was probably, at least in one of the dialects, actually a sh at many points in history in Babylonian, but that's just maybe. So those transliterations can be very important for reconstructing pronunciations. But as you saw from me rambling on about the various uncertain things in the various languages, this can become sort of a zero-sum game. If you don't know exactly what one sound sounded like in one language, and then you use that letter or transliteration to explain another sound in another language, you can go wrong because you're not certain in either case. And this is a problem when you have scholars from different fields working on different languages that don't really know the discussion on a specific language and then use what they read in handbooks about language A to explain transliterations of words from language B without knowing that the descriptions from the handbooks may be simplifications of things that are much, much more complicated under much of a vociferous debate which means that you have to, to do this in a good way. You sort of have to know something of the discussion concerning the various sounds in both the languages you're looking at. You can't just look at the handbook version of one of them, uh, or it has to be a very good handbook that actually mentions the problems and discussions that are underway. Another thing that you can use to, to reconstruct pronunciation is spelling variations, because spelling variations within a language both synchronically and diachronically can say something about what a specific sound would have sounded like. For example, if you see two letters that were kept separate for a long time, then starting to get confused at one point, you can probably infer that those have started to sound similar. Very classical example of this, Hebrew has a letter called sin, which looks exactly like sheen, but has uh, the dot on the other side, if you have pointed letters with a Masoretic pointing. And the scholarly consensus today is that the sin, which is in all reading traditions except Samaritan, always pronounced s, just, just as an s, that it was originally something like sh. The reasons for this, again, has to do with partly transliterations into other languages. And it's another story, the fact that sin was originally clean. I may come back to that. But anyway, you can see in later Aramaic and Biblical Hebrew, you can see that uh, the scribes start confusing sin with samech, which gives us an inkling that this is when the sin has actually started being pronounced not as sh, but as s. That is, the two letters have fallen together, that the, the two sounds have fallen together, and therefore the letters are getting confused. So there you can use those sort of misspellings as signs of phonological change. Now we're getting to the really difficult stuff, stuff inherent in spelling systems. For example, take cuneiform. Cuneiform writes syllables and whole words. And cuneiform was used for many different languages. It was invented for Sumerian, and then it was used for Akkadian and Hittite and Hurrian and lots of other languages of the ancient Near East. When cuneiform was borrowed from one language to another, the scribes tried to adapt it for their new language. But we know things from how the spellings in cuneiform are generally used that can help us surmise how they would have done that. But this is, this is difficult uh, because there can be new inventions of spellings and uh, weird adaptations. For example, there's an ongoing discussion that, that has been going on for years and years and years about the... Anatolian cuneiform languages, the Indo-European languages of ancient Anatolia that are written in cuneiform, mainly Hittite and Luvian. Those aren't the only ones, but mainly those. There's a thing where they spell certain stop sounds, that is, t, d, p, b, k, g sounds, either as a single tone, that is just one t or p or g, or two syllables with two, that is, they contrast t and t, t, and P and p, p, so to speak, and k and k, 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 but they don't seem to contrast the different signs for voiced and unvoiced. That is, they don't seem to. Well, there are people who think there is a contrast, but they generally don't contrast t and d and k and g and p and b that much. So there was clearly a difference between the singleton and the 
geminate, that is double spelling, but what was that difference? Some people think the difference was one of length. Some people think the difference was one of aspiration. Some think it was a difference in voice, because if you look at transliterations into other languages, you can see that the singletons seem to have been voiced between vowels. Was that voicing the important trait or wasn't it? Well, that's a difficult part of in interpreting the spelling, because it's one thing to sort of reconstruct what it would have sounded like just to speaker of another language. There you can use the transliterations as, he as help. And another is reconstructing the phonology, that is, which were the phonological traits that actually distinguished sounds. Was the difference the voicing, or was the difference the length, or was it both? I think it was both myself. Well, I've written about this. Uh, so these things inherent in the spelling system, that's a an important but difficult piece of evidence. And then you have the evidence from comparative linguistics. Many of the languages of the ancient world, not all of them, but many of them are parts of linguistic families, obviously. Indo-European, Semitic, horo uratian what have you. And if that's the case, you can sometimes use etymological reasoning to argue that, well, this sound appears in the same place where sound X occurs in closely related languages. Therefore, we may perhaps infer that the sound was similar. That's how people came to infer, for example, that the th sound or the th letter of Ugaritic was indeed a th, since other Semitic languages like Arabic have a th there, at least classical Arabic, in the same places in etymologically connected words. On the other hand, Sounds change. Like I mentioned, I am personally of the opinion that at least in later Ugaritic text, the th had switched to a s sound. So you can't always be sure that the etymological reconstruction of a sound is the correct one. But again, it gives you something to work with. And finally, you have typology, which is general knowledge about how phonological systems tend to work. Some phonological systems are more common than others. It's very common to have five vowels or three vowels, for example. But there are languages like Swedish, which, if you count both the long and short vowels, has close to 20 vowels. Well, 17 18, depending on how you count. So there are outliers there. And a language closely related to Swedish, Danish, has developed a very, very divergent phonology with glottalizations and uh, pharyngeals in some contexts and, uh, and weird sounds that normally don't occur in this part of the world. So things can change pretty quickly and unexpected things can change. One thing I mentioned in an earlier video is the fact that there is this idea that ancient Egyptian developed ions from d sounds, which would typologically be very rare. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. So as a scholar, one has to weigh all these things together. Reading traditions, ancient descriptions of sounds, transliterations into other languages, spelling variations, features inherent in the script or spelling system, knowledge from comparative linguistics, and typology. All of these things have to be sort of blended and weighed against one another to reconstruct what a language would have sounded like at a certain point. And it's a frustrating experience, but also an exhilarating one. Yeah, so uh, that's how you reconstruct <laughs> the pronunciations of languages that are no longer spoken as native languages. Uh, and all those languages have texts that read better in those original languages. Thank you and goodbye.